This is January 2022, and I'm Bob Wasson teaching a research night, um, and we're into my 10th year of doing these bi-monthly um, research nights. They're meant to be a little deeper than what you get uh, in your local fellowships or in your church. They're, as well as I can do it, I, count, I couch it in a, a level of almost seminary, but we keep it all biblical, so it shouldn't be too hard. In fact, I thought of it today and was reminded today that I did my first Zoom conference with uh, the moniker Doctrine and Practice about when we figured Tom 2017, sure. Uh, and I had taught the first one of my own um, with affiliations to no one but myself, on why angels are called stars. So if you want to go back and listen to it, it's on the website. Uh, but this one, folks, uh, I've got too many titles, but we're going to use them all anyway. Celestial Powers and the Secret of God, part one of the chain gang. And I know that some of these titles just make you want to come to these fellowships to just hear what the hell Bob's going to teach. And that's why I, I titled them the way I do. Uh, this one's a very important two-part, we see that this is part one, two-part session because I have a lot of groundwork to lay for those who've never heard of this stuff. For those of you that have, a lot of it's going to be repeat, but it'll be couched in a little different way as I build uh, the foundations to teach part two. So uh, the chain gang has to do with two verses of scripture in the Christian uh, era. Uh, Jude 1, 6, and the angels who did not keep their authority they had, but left their appointed sphere, uh, he has kept in darkness in eternal bonds until the judgment of the great day. That eternal bonds is, is in other translations. This is the New Jerusalem, which is a paraphrase, but uh, in other translations, it's chains. And so you look at this verse, and it's like, Really, what angels didn't keep the authority there? What's an appointed sphere, and where the hell is the dark, darkness and eternal bonds? Well, those are all good questions. And the first thing I'm going to say is, warning, spookiness is not allowed. I had someone tell me that my angel teachings were, were, kind of, were, were spooky, and they're not meant to be spooky. We'll get into some of that. Um, there's a tendency in Christendom to discount the supernatural. And I also could say to, you know, poo-poo it if it's not about Jesus and God. Anyway, regardless of the fact that Jesus was raised from the dead, I mean, think about it, raised from the dead, right? The fact that people become desensitized to godliness, and that's a true and vital spiritual relationship with God and the Son, or, or, or and I'll say communication with and from the quote-unquote spirit world. It's more of an occult thing these days that, you know, Christ, that not something that Christians do on a regular basis. You can, you can talk about the Trinity, just like I said, but that's it. Angels, not so much. Jesus and God do the talking. Oh, really? Well, we're going to read a little bit different from the Bible. But I really I thought about this this week, major reasons. And by the way, as you all know, you can have a copy of a PDF of this because I think you'll want to make notes on your own or you'll want to have some of this because I'm going to go fast, as I always do, and let you do the thinking, and you do the, uh, get the uh, PDF and go through this on your own. But I was thinking this week that the reason that there's so much ungodliness, because the church teaches that the manifestations and the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, for the most part, mostly it's apostles and prophets, because, you know, you can have a teacher or pastor, right? But they stopped after the book of Acts, or, or the other one is, and you'll find this a lot in Reformed churches, that the gospel is the only power of salvation, excuse me, power of God available to the, to the church person. Or church is your religious obligation, it's only on Sunday, let's get back to real living after that. Or you can't learn anything new from the Bible, because everybody's been around for a long time, and there's a lot of really smart people that wrote a lot of smart stuff, and they know what they're talking about, Bob, so you be quiet. Or... You can't know those spooky players, folks, without a program. We're going to get into the spooky player. I may use that derogatorily. 
uh, because I, I hated that. This is not spooky stuff, folks. This is Bible stuff. And I don't teach it just to hear my tongue wag. All right? But you can't know the players without a program. We got the program in the Bible. That's the same way as in sports, right? And you're not going to know what's available in the spiritual realm. You know, it's probably got a really good biblical name, but we're using that one right now. Unless you know the details and you organize your life with them in mind, prayer being a good particular in that organizational thing with spirits. So this is a weird angel verse teaching, the weird ones, a series of textual explications. Here's the other one from the Christian scriptures regarding the chain gang. Or if God did not spare the angels when they sinned, but threw them into Tartarus and committed them to, there they are, chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment. So you know that Jude and Peter have been talking so they because they know the same stuff. Well, they weren't necessarily talking, but they did read the same book of Enoch, which has to do with a lot of this stuff. So we're going to get into the why and the when. Do or did these angels sin? Did you notice here that the, the REV translation is the only one I know of that gets it right there in the dark black? Threw them into Tartarus. That's a one-word verb in the Greek. It's the only place you'll ever see the word Tartarus in the Christian scriptures. I'll get into that a little bit later. So anyway, here's my outline for part one. Only good angels are in heaven, question mark. And there's some things about God not trusting his angels. What? I thought it was all nice up there. There are holy angels that says so in scripture. So they're uh, logically what? And then angels ascend and descend, and we're going to look at the Satan in Job chapters 1 and 2 a little bit. Genesis 6 had problems, right? The disobedient ones, the sons of God in Genesis 6, we'll get into that, are the ones that are talked about in Jude and 2 Peter. Those are the angels that sinned. And then the dragon sinned in the beginning, says so in 1 John 3.8. We'll look at that. Number three in my session is another boundary that is not well known. There's a, there's a boundary, not just the prison that we're going to talk about, but another boundary. That's in Job 38 and Genesis 1, 6 through 8. Some of you know it well. And then the final thing before I finish tonight, the ancient Near East conception or cosmological map. And so many of you know that one where Philippians shows that there are beings that are under the earth. Where the hell is that? And Luke uh, 8.28 about not wanting to be thrown into the abyss. We're going to get into these tonight. So theology says, and here's Bob's on a Bob's on a photo, John. There are only good angels in heaven, and there they are. The ones on the bottom right, I think that's Da Vinci. Maybe Chrissy knows. I can't remember. I copied and pasted this from it. A, a, uh, but I like the ones on the left better. They're so so right. The long hair, the blonde, the wings. There are only good angels in heaven. Um, and here's what they say about heaven. Theology is all over it, right? Prevailing sentiment. Heaven is already a realm of peace and love, says T.F. Glasson from the book, Jesus in the End of the World. Okay. Or imagine that the best things of life on earth, not possible, expanded by a gazillion times, better than anything you've ever experienced. Now imagine living in the end of kind of environment forever. No struggle, no disease, no pain, no death, no justice, no uh, injustice, sorry. Uh, <laughs> no evil. Just the best of the best of the best on spiritual steroid. That's heaven. Okay. Those are just two of. Uh, uh, Two of the sentiments, I could have copied a million. And I did this because it isn't so. But here's another paradigm that we have to live in. There's good angels. They live where? On the fluffy clouds, right? With the hearts and the wings. Or the bad angels live, of course, there. And we know though there is. Dante told us where there is. Or maybe it's this paradigm, the shoulder dance. Wait, you know, we got the. The good guy on the right, the good guy, the bad guy on the on the left. And uh, wait a minute, are they allowed to do this? Good question. Or in our modern textual or uh, contextual uh, TV environment, the reading of the text and scriptures, you'll find out there are rules and regs governing the activities of angels and devils. 
and we'll see more in this series. And I say series because there's going to be more than just part one and two of the chain gang. I'm thinking of doing a lot more angel verses and teachings and understanding the spiritual realm. So the depiction of good angels is the rum drums, right? The prim and proper bow tie dude on the right. And I gave him a halo just for the hell of it. And of course, the more stylish, better glasses, uh, you know, more slick coat on the left, which is, of course, the other guy. And this is, I think this is, yeah, I said it's from the show Good Omens, which is running today on, on uh, like, whatever it is, probably, uh, what is the one? Uh, Prime, Prime Video, which, by the way, The Chosen is on Prime Video. And if you haven't seen The Chosen, oh, my goodness, get a TV and get Prime Video. Because that series on Jesus and his his folks, best thing I've ever seen in my life. That's how good it is. All right. So God does not trust his angels. That's what the Bible says, not what theology says. Here we go. <clears throat> Job 4, 17, Job 15, 15, and Job 25, 15. Three times it said in one book, can mankind be just before God? Can a man be pure before his maker? Parallelism. He puts, he, God, puts no trust in even in his servants. Against his angels, he charges error. How much more than those who dwell in houses of clay, meaning us, whose foundation is in the dust, who are crushed before the moth? Uh, well, there's a host of evangelicals that think the angels, only angels in heaven are holy angels, folks. They're just, it's huge. In other words, any that fell did so at the beginning, of course, right? They all fell, or at least a third of them fell, and they were all bad. Uh, that's not true, by the way. Uh, with the shining one, son of the dawn, right? Lucifer was there back in the beginning, wasn't he? And everybody said, no, Lucifer was not back there in the beginning. It was the dragon. He wasn't called Lucifer. He's never called Lucifer in Scripture. Anyway, this kind of hermeneutic that there are only good angels in heaven is going to drive you crazy. Because here's the other two verses, right? He puts no trust in his holy ones, and the heavens are not pure in his sight. That's angel stuff. And then the bottom one, um, the stars are not pure in his sight, relates to angels too. Now, Here's just so you know, things that are coming about. And, and oh, going back a few slides. Um, let me go back to this one so you don't read the other one. But you know, the the, the idea that there would be uh, just peace, love, and dove. You've heard me say it in heaven. And the, those two theological works that I quoted. That you know, it's a million times anything you could think. It's just wonderful up there. Well, it's not wonderful now. It won't be wonderful in the future because it says in Revelation 12 that you all know there was a war in heaven after Jesus got up there at some time in the future. And then there's a rebellion before that war, which we're going to get into a little bit, maybe part of it this week. But the point is, look at these guys. These are in the, this is Isaiah 24, 34, and another one of 34. Well, 24 and 21. On that day, that's the day of the Lord. Ain't come yet, folks. We're not in it yet. He's not here yet. The Lord will punish the host of heaven. Where? In heaven and the kings of earth on the earth. Isaiah 34, 4. The army of the heavens will rot. <laughs> that's a good one for you, Barb. Even though they're not stars, it's going to rot. The heavens will be rolled up like a scroll. All the armies will, there it is, fall like a leaf, fall from off the vine as a leaf. A uh, fig falls from the fig tree. And then the last one, 34, 5 through 8. My sword, this is God's, or his anointed, I can't remember the context, is satiated, full of fat in heaven. Behold, it will descend in judgment upon Edom and upon all the people whom I've devoted to destruction, technical term of the Hebrew. The word, or excuse me, sword of the Lord is what? Filled with blood. How do you have blood in heaven and or on earth, right? His sword of blood. Uh, it's satiated with fat and the blood of the lambs and goats, blah, blah, blah. Down near the end there, verse 7, wild oxen will also fall with them. Well, let's just read it, Bob. It's satiated, verse 6, with the blood of lambs and goats and with the fat of the kidneys and rams. The Lord has a sacrifice where? In Basra. And great slaughter in the land of Edom, which is the word for red, uh, wild oxen will fall with them, and young bulls, and these aren't, these aren't really bulls, with strong ones, thus their land will be soaked with blood, and their dust become greasy with fat. The Lord has a day of vengeance, a year of recompense for the cause of Zion. So, 
It's all peace, love, and done? I don't think so. I'm fighting against this. I've been fighting it since I realized some 10, maybe 50, not about 15 years ago that Lucifer, didn't, Lucifer did not fall in the beginning. He doesn't fall until the end times. The guy in Isaiah 14, if you read the context, it says the day of the Lord four times. And uh, that's another whole teaching that's on the website, on the YouTube channel called Lucifer and Jesus. But the excursus, uh, primer, if you will, the devil in the guise of Lucifer, the dude has fallen to the earth and he can't get up. He was dragged according to the Revelation 9, and he dragged his angels down there to a third of them, right? That means all along with a third of those stars, meaning angels, who he threw down there on the planet, we therefore have no bad angels in heaven left at this time. Well, that's just not true. It's absolutely not true. Um, and we'll be finding out why it's not true as we go through this. And there's a lot of Bible you've got to put under your belt and think about it. All right, here's one for you. Um, why can't God's kingdom come to earth? Come to the earth. I want that in the back of your mind. Why did Jesus pray while he was here, right in the middle of our, our you know, timeline, 2,000 years ago? Why is he praying, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven? And a lot of people read that and they say, well, God's will is being done on, in heaven. Well, yeah, that doesn't mean there aren't any recalcitrant angels trying to usurp his throne from here to yonder, or there's not any angels up there now that aren't disobeying because they do. Just because there's a kingdom up there doesn't mean that, you know, he's in total control of everything. You can't even speak if you're going to say a bad word. He didn't say it. Anyway, I'm fighting this. And you should too, because even in Ephesians 6, 12, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against the authority, against the cosmic powers over the present darkness. He's, Darby says, against the universal lords of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness. And where are they? At the time of Paul's writing, they're in heavenly places. They're dark lords. <laughs> okay. I don't know if you guys ever saw the movie. Uh, what's the one? I don't know, with Will Smith. It's a good one. Anyway, so look at the first thing. Wrestling is a fight. Second thing, enemy is spiritual. Third thing, spiritual forces are evil. Number four, they're not on the earth. <laughs> they're not all on the earth, at least, right? We know a third of them are, but not all of them. Spiritual forces of evil where? In heavenly places. This is the quintessential battle text, in my understanding. Evil in heaven. We wrestle with them. Do we physically wrestle? Come on. Come on. Get past that. We're going to get into some more understanding of how we wrestle. It doesn't, does it say Jesus wrestles for us? Does it say that? It, it, don't think it if it doesn't say it. Revelation 12, you know about this stuff. Great sign appeared in heaven. I'm focused on where these evil things are. Great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed to the sun, moon at her feet, a uh, head with crown of 12 stars. She was had a child cried out, being in labor, getting ready to give birth. Who's that? That's the Jesus boy. That's the constellation Virgo in heaven. Another sign appeared in heaven, a great red dragon. Is he a good guy? No. This is at the birth of Christ, right? Seven heads, ten horns, bad dude, seven diadems, his tail, when? At the birth, swept down a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. Dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she gave birth, we're still in the birth time period, 3 BC, 3 BC, September 11th, 3 BC, when this occurred, okay, so that when she gave birth, she might devour the, he might devour the child, nice guy, okay, she gave birth to the son, male child, rule, he's going to rule the nation's rod of iron, and he was caught up to God in his throne, that's just like the life, death, life, uh, death, resurrection, ascension, and, and after that of Jesus in one verse, so anyway, so then the woman was in the wilderness, had a place prepared for her by God, so that there she would be nursed 1,260 days. And then, then, then what? And there was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fighting the dragon. Dragon waged war. They were not strong enough. There was no longer a place for them to found it. The great red dragon was thrown down. The serpent of old, who's called the devil and Satan, thrown and <clears throat> who deceives the world, he was thrown down. 
This is after the birth of Jesus. And it's telling you right now, it's in the eschaton because you're reading the 1,260 days, which equals three and a half years, which equals 42 months. It's all eschatological stuff. But he was thrown down. And guess what? His angels were thrown down with him. Did it say the third of the angels up there in the top were his? Nope. Angels are allowed to come down, descend, and go up, ascend, and do things. I told you this was somewhat of a foundation or a primer. And we know this one. This is the Jacob's Ladder record, right? E. Jacob had a dream in which he saw uh, a stairway, and it's usually, well, I think it's best translated ramp, uh, resting on, not a, certainly not a ladder, okay? Um, stairway to heaven, I chose the NIV because they had stairway and so many of you are Led Zeppelin fans. I figured you might like to see where uh, Led Zeppelin got the stairway to heaven. Um, anyway, the angels were going up and going down. Some say that it was only a dream. So how do we know? How do we trust Jacob? Da, 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 da. Well, we trust because Jesus established it. And look at that. I didn't give you the reference. That's not good. It's in Luke. Um, I think it's in Luke. I'll find it for you. Stick it in here before I send out the... Uh, P, a PDF. Jesus answered and said unto him, Nathaniel, because I said unto you, saw me, I saw you under the fig tree, and uh, do you believe me? That's what he's going Really? That's all you, you believe because I, I said I saw you? You will see greater things than these. And he said, Truly, truly, I say unto you that you'll see the heavens open, angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Okay? Uh, so it's not just a dream in Jacob's head, it's a construct, of course. Um, as to coming up and down a ladder or a ramp or a, you know, a stairway. But everybody knows that James, angels appear as humans. They walk around on earth. They also, they're also called people. In so many more places than you think they are people people, they are heavenly people. And you just have to read the context to understand it. Usually they are doing assigned tasks. Jobs for God, that's what they do. What's a, the, the word for uh, angel uh, in, in, in Hebrew is malak. Uh, and, and those of you that have a bit of Hebrew or know any, it's the word message, messenger. That's what angels do. Some of them, not all of them. And usually they're not even called angels when they're not doing the messaging, which is bringing a message to or from, uh, to or for God or Jesus, now that he's up there. Uh, anyway, they have jobs, okay? We're going to get into a few of the jobs. Uh, just to touch on uh, the one of the guys that had a job, Job 1.6. And there was a day when the sons of God, that's another word for angelic beings, they were there at the beginning, Job 38, came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan also came among them. Now, he, the NAU and every other, you know, uh, translation will capitalize the word Satan here. It's not to be capitalized. The Hebrew is, is a non-capitalized. It's the Hasatan, the Satan. It's just a dude, an adversary. And it was an adversary in the council. He's an officer in the council doing his job. He's a very sly dude. And he what his job was, was questioning and doing things. The Lord said unto the, the Satan, from where do you come? Well, I've been roaming about the earth and walking around it. So where are they now? They're in heaven, because that's where the council of the Lord happens on a very high mountain in the very far north. It's called the Mount of Assembly, Har Moed, which is the word for Armageddon in the Greek in the book of Revelation. So the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? Blah, blah, blah. And you know the record. And here's another one, <clears throat> another one doing his job. You'll love this job, Exodus 12, 23. For the Lord will pass through you know, to smite the Egyptians. And when he sees the, the Lord, is it the Lord that's really going to come down and do that? Well, you'll see. He sees the blood on the lintel and, um, and on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not allow, here's the dude, the destroyer to come into your houses to smite you. <laughs> and Psalm 78, 49 clears it up. He let loose on them his fierce anger, wrath, indignation, distress, a company of destroying angels. Not only wasn't it the Lord himself, 
It was thus just the Lord in, a, in the umbrella clause here. The umbrella clause is used a lot. <clears throat> the Lord will pass over the door? No. The destroying angels, in other terms, their head dude, the destroyer, who's used a lot of scripture, they just had a job. God said, if they don't have the blood on the doorpost, they're dead. That's your job. Okay, so if they're holy angels, logic tells us, and they all said, unholy angels. Of course they are. Here's the verses for the word holy angels, so you know I'm not just flapping my gums. For whosoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man also will be ashamed of him when he comes in the glory of his Father with the dudes, okay, the holy angels. That's because by that time, you know, the dragon and his angels are no longer in heaven, so they're all holy angels. There's a parallel in Luke. Revelation 14, uh, 10. He, the worshiper of the beast, by the way, also will drink the wine of the fury of God. Just read the Old Testament about that. Which is prepared unmixed in the cup of his wrath, the grapes of his wrath. And he will be tormented with fire and sulfur. Where? In the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Folks, by the time Revelation comes around, we're part of the holy angels group. We get to watch them get thrown into the lake of fire. It's cool. I'm waiting. I got my asbestos coat. So does the Lord. Acts 10, 22. This is in the middle here, right? And they said, Cornelius, the centurion, a righteous God-fearing man, who was well spoken of by the whole Jewish nation, was divinely instructed by a holy angel. So there were some holy angels that were divinely instructing people that needed to hear them. But I'll tell you right now, they there are unholy angels that maybe left holy from heaven, come down, and they divinely instruct in a really bad way. <laughs> if you ever, that blue, see that blue I highlighted there? I was talking to Greg Payer this week. I said, just started working the verb that's behind that, divinely instructed by a holy angel. It's a hell of a, a, hell of a verb. <laughs> have, have some fun with it. Like I think it's used seven or eight times. Anyway, there's a, a holy angel that helped Cornelius. We're loving it. And there are other words for it here. The chosen angels, right? 1 Timothy 5, 21. I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus and of his chosen or elect in the KJV angels. Chosen is, and just like you see the elect, you know, in Romans, they got, we're part of the elect. Well, so are these angels. They're part of the elect. They've made the choice. You know, I don't know, <laughs> certainly don't think they can get born from above because they're already there, but born of God, maybe, you know, but they're all, you know, there are at least chosen angels. And then in the next, Paul isn't just saying God and Jesus, uh, isn't saying that only God and Jesus are in this mix here. If you look at the context, I'm going to charge you in the presence of all three of these, these peoples, God, Jesus, and the elect angels. They're part, you want a trinity? There's a good one. God's angels, his holy ones, Hebrew term uses kodeshim. I taught that, oh, about a year ago, I think, Barb, right? Also participate in Christian activities. Or maybe God just wants to throw them a bone, like, let us make God, let us make man in our image, right? God's, it's really only God and Jesus, but the, the, the angels have to get some credit. So we'll just throw them a verse or two. No, stop thinking that you can't study angels with the same detail that you can with Jesus and God. And you better, because you'll get in the, you won't know your ass from your elbow unless you do. Angels sin? Well, right. Are you going to tell me Jesus is not God? Well, I might, right? There's the dragon, the Nakash in the garden, the watchers in Daniel and in the book of Enoch, if you have, ever read it, and the nations disinherited by God, and Yahweh takes Israel for his own and gives those disinherited nations to the sons of God. And here we go. The devil has been sinning from the beginning. And I'm going to show you this for the umpteenth time because I know it's taken me a hard time to get here. The, de the dragon is the devil. It says so in two places in John the Revelator. And we know it from a few other places. The Nakash in the garden starts to clue us in that there's going to be not only seed of the woman, but Nakash has a seed. And oh my gosh, they show up. Well, they show up, we don't know if it's the first time, but here they show up in Genesis 6, the seed of the devil actually happens. 
he has children. Say it isn't so. Well, I'm sorry, there were Nephilim. That's what the, the offspring of the sons of God and the daughters of men were. They were Nephilim, which doesn't mean fall, by the way. That whenever you read that, the ones that fell are what we're going to get into tonight. The sons of God were the ones that were thrown into prison, not the Nephilim. Nephilim means giant in Aramaic. Uh, Enoch, and you'd expect that because they were giants. Enoch calls, talks the, uh, calls these sons of God watchers. What did they watch for? And then here we go, the last two verses that we started this session with, we'll get into. So here, many of you know this. Please em embellish this on your refrigerator. The one who practices sin is of the devil for the devil has sinned from the beginning. It's a big deal, folks. He didn't sin only in the garden. That's not the beginning. That's after the beginning. The Son of God appeared for this purpose. What? To destroy the works of the devil. What's one work? Wrecking creation. Genesis 1-2 says so in Romans 8. Creation's frustrated. It waits for the manifestation of the sons of God because then it'll be free from bondage. Revelation 20.10, and the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and should be tormented day and night forever. Okay, uh, that's the purpose. There is an end to the dragon, okay? He's thrown in, by the way, read the record. He's thrown in, I think, ooh, I can't remember. Um, I think he's called the dragon in some places you don't expect it in the book of Revelation. I'll just leave it at that. So from the beginning, not from the garden, I said that Adam, the sin of Adam and the deception of Eve is not the beginning. The, in, the Eden, and don't, don't try to fudge it with me. You won't, get, you won't get away with it. It's not the beginning. The beginning was the beginning, okay? And here, blue, the blue thing on the left there, the beginning, sinning of the devil, was seen in verse 2 of Genesis 1. Now the earth had become a welter and a waste. It's not a good thing that happened there in Genesis 1-2. And I've taught this last summer in three very separate uh, very uh, detailed sections of how to understand Genesis 1, 1, Genesis 1, 1 through 3, and especially Genesis 1, 2, which I always say is much more important than verse 1. The devil sinned originally. We know those of you that are good Catholics like me, the original sin was Adam sinning. No, 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 no. The devil sinned originally, but God devised a plan, and here's the plan. Here's the plan. It's called the purpose of the ages, the big red stuff right there in the middle, um, where Jesus was a part of it, right? He purposed the purpose of the ages in Christ Jesus our Lord. And we'll see that, okay? Jesus wasn't the, don't ever fall for that one. Jesus wasn't the purpose. He wasn't the end all of it. He was part of it. God purposed it in, watch that phrase, in Christ Jesus our Lord. Here we go. Before the found, whoop, went too fast. Before the foundation of the world is where this was put into place, and I've taught this, but I'm going to throw go through this fairly quickly tonight. Ephesians one one through six. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, to the saints who are at Ephesus, who are faithful, where in Christ Jesus. Grace to you, peace from God our Father, Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places where in christ jesus for here it is just as he god chose us in him christ jesus before the foundation of the world that we would be holy and blameless before him god in love and he predestined us chose us uh, as to adoption as sons through christ jesus jesus christ excuse me to himself according to the kind intention of his will to the praise of the glory of his grace, that's God's, which he freely bestowed on us. Where? Again, in the beloved, in Christ Jesus. Now, he chose us in, and there's three phrases where this pro before, the, the Greek uh, preposition before the foundation of the world. Here, here in John, where it says in the middle, we won't read the whole thing. He, Jesus is talking to God, you loved me before the foundation of the world, right? And then 1 Peter 1.17, it, 
if you address as father, the one who impartially judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves in fear during the time of your stay. I love the word sojourn there, sojourn on earth, knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver and gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers. Talking to Israelites here, Jews had forefathers, Gentiles did not. But with the precious blood as of a lamb, unblemished, spotless, the blood of Christ, okay? For he, Jesus, was foreknown where? Before the foundation of the world. So the question is, when was that? It's before God founded the world, stretched forth the heavens, always used in conjunction with founding the world, building the world. Well, what happened? The world was wrecked. God needed to build it. It took him six days. So after Genesis 1-2, he planned people to be, he planned for the Christ and people to be in the Christ. That would be the secret. That would be us. So there's how he planned the solution to destroy the works of the devil. It's coming, folks. It's coming. It ain't done yet. And Jesus was part of it. And it's not blasphemy, folks. He's only part of it. He's a man. We're men. Okay, so the original sin was that. So here, finally, Bob's focus is on the particular set of sinning angels. And um, we finally got into the part where everybody was waiting for it. <clears throat> that, well, we'll see. So there are other sinning angels, not shining ones, son of the dawn. That's what the word Lucifer is in Hebrew in Isaiah 14. That's a shining one. And you know that angels show up and they're always shiny they're in they're in linen they got shiny swords they got shiny breastplates they got shiny eyes you can't look at them look at revelation chapter one <laughs> that's really funny so we're not shining angels no these are sinning angels along with the dragon who was sinning from the beginning <clears throat> here it is first one but false prophets also arose among the people, that's Israel, just as there will also be false teachers among you, which is the people he's ministering to, who will secretly introduce destructive heresies, <clears throat> even denying the master who bought them, bringing swift destruction upon themselves. I've highlighted the word destruction three times, and you can see why. Many will follow their sensuality, and because of them, the way of truth, one of the terms that we use for Christianity, will be maligned. <laughs> and in there, what is the word here? Greed, money, 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 and power, 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 power. They will exploit you with false words. Folks, to continue the verse in Semitic parallelism, their judgment from long ago is not idle. Their destruction is not asleep. For if God did not spare angels when they sin, but cast them to hell, I'll get into that, and committed them to pits of darkness, they're also reserved for judgment. And destruction and judgment, they're coming. Can't get away. They're coming, and it's been planned for for a long time. Uh, you read, I read earlier, I can't remember the verse, but it talked about those who are devoted for destruction. The, the, these are the same guys, okay? <clears throat> oh, so here we go. So if God did not spare the angels when they sinned, well, when did they sin? I'm telling you, it's Genesis 6, but we'll get there. But he threw them to uh, Tartarus. In the other verse, it was to hell. So that's the word Tartarus. Throw them into hell, one word in the Greek, Tartara, um, and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept to the judgment. Okay? Tartarus is a part of Hades Sheol. Hades Sheol, Hades is the Greek word, Sheol is the uh, Hebrew word. Okay? Tartarus is a part of Hades Sheol. Okay? And just, just to show you that I'm not, you know, pulling your leg here and what we'll, you can read the context later uh let's read it now but jezurun it's another word for israel waxed fat and kicked 
Thou art waxed fattened. Thou art grown thick. Thou art covered with fatness. This is Israel that uh, Moses is talking about in chapter 32. It's a gangbuster. You want your ears pinned back? Read, read, read Deuteronomy 32 and explicate it for yourself. Anyway, Israel's fat. Then he, Israel, forsook God which made him. Okay, and lightly esteemed the rock of his salvation. They provoked him to jealousy with strange gods. With abominations provoked they him to anger. They sacrificed unto devils, not to God, to gods. You see how that's equated there? Unto devils, not God, but to gods. Devils equal gods. Whom they knew. That's a weird word for devils, by the way, in Hebrew. Whom they knew not. Ready for this? Two new gods that came newly up. And your head goes, who came newly up from where? Ooh, we're going to get into that. Whom your fathers feared not, of the rock that begat thee, thou art unmindful. You're stupid. You have forgotten God that formed you. <laughs> unmindful is a kind word used by Moses. I think, I think Paul calls him stupid. I think Isaiah went that far. And when the Lord saw it, he abhorred them because of the provoking of his sons and of his daughters. And he said, I will hide my face from them. I will see that their end shall be, um, for they are a very froward, KJV, right? Yep, KJV. Froward, untoward is another word, generation, uh, um, asinine, uh, sort of arrogant, froward, froward. I will see what their end shall be, for they are very froward generation, children in whom it is no faith. <laughs> nice. They have moved me to jealousy with which is not, uh, excuse me, they have moved me with jealousy with that which is not God. See, the, that which, it could be he who. The, that which is just thrown in there, and it's an italic. So everybody says, well, it's those little handmade idols. And that doesn't have to be because it already tells you devil, devils are gods, and they're worshiping other gods. Remember Exodus uh, 20, verse 1, I'm Lord thy God, thou shalt have no other gods before me, means that there are other gods. Don't ever forget that, okay? So he moved to jealousy for those uh, which are not a people uh, to anger a foolish nation. Next verse 22, here it is. For a file is kindled in mine anger. It's I, I started, I stoked it up, folks. I kindled it in my anger. It shall burn where? Unto the lowest hell. Now, did you know that there was the lowest hell? Well, that's why, the, that's why Peter can use Tartaros. He just used the Greek word for it. And shall consume the earth with their increase and set on, found, set on fire the foundations of the mountains. They thought this was under the ground, folks. And that's another construct. So is parts of hell under the ground. And as we will see, there are, well, we'll, we'll get there. I will heap mischiefs upon them. I will spend, spend my arrows upon them. And I just threw this together this afternoon to give you a little bit of study to do. There are, oh, I believe, how many did I say? 14? Yeah, 14 places in the Hebrew scriptures that use the construct uh, that's the Hebrew construct, uh, the way of do, put, putting together a Hebrew uh, sentence is, can be in a hot construct or absolute, and it's equivalent to uh, a Greek uh, contrast or, in this case, a superlative. Uh, so the Hebrew construct with the word, uh, uh, here it is at the top, there it is, I gave it to you, by uh, shell. so uh, in the uh, lower parts, in in the lower parts of the little tick there before the red, almost W is the word is the the, the construct for form. Uh, it's the lower parts of hell. Okay, it's difficult to see in the English, but easy in the Hebrew. So Sheol has lower parts to it. Um, I can give you. I'm working on something to to make sure you know that Tartarus is not some crazy place that you know didn't exist in the uh, Hebrew scriptures. So anyway, we did two Peter. Now let's go back to Jude, which was the first verse. Now the first slide, Jude 1, 1. Jude, a bond servant of Jesus Christ, the father of James, to those who called loved God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ, love that, may mercy and peace and love be multiplied to you, beloved. 
while I was making every effort to write to you about our common salvation, I felt the necessity to write to you, appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith which was once uh, for all handed down to the saints, the holy ones. Think of yourself as the holy one, like the Kodashim, okay, the holy ones, the army. Um, for certain persons have crept in unnoticed. Where? Into fellowships. Those who were, here it is again, long before marked out for this condemnation. It's those devoted to destruction people. It's the same dudes that 2 Peter was talking about. These are ungodly persons who turned the grace of our God into licentiousness and deny our only master and Lord, Jesus Christ. Now, I desire to remind you, okay, so I'm going to, though you know all things once for all, that the Lord, after saving a people out of the land of Egypt, subsequently destroyed those who did not believe. How did he do that? He opened up the ground in a couple of instances, had them eaten by, uh, bitten by snakes, you know. But the angels who did not keep their own domain but abandoned their proper abode, those he has kept in eternal bonds under darkness for the judgment of the great dead. They're incarcerated. Let's go through Jude 1.6 together. Again, we got some parallelism here. Peter was a Jew. He knew his Jewish scriptures. He kept it parallel. The angels who did not keep their what? Positions of authority. They abandoned their proper dwelling. Those he has kept in darkness, and he has bound in everlasting chains for the judgment of the great day. Um, we're not going to get into the very important part of position of authority or their proper dwelling. I don't think I get into that tonight because I've done it in so many other, um, so many other uh, research nights. But just look, what they did is they disobeyed. They left where God had put them and decided they wanted to come to the earth. And they did in Genesis 6. And the reason I know this is because these sections, if you read these, the book of Jude and the book of 2 Peter, chapter 1, um, are all about the time before Noah, when the Nephilim were on the earth, right there in the middle of the red, uh, in those days, and also afterwards, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, and they bore children, uh, and they were the Nephilim, okay? And again, that's not the word to fall, because the Nephilim didn't fall. Their progeny fell. The sons of God were the ones who are in chains of darkness. They're very powerful people to be in chains of darkness under the ground in Tartarus. Okay, and again, um, I want you to understand that it's a construct. We've been really, really far down there, and there's not a, a hell if you will, and we've been really high up, and there's really no heaven up, but for these people, heaven was up, hell was down, and there were many, many beings under the ground that are still alive, okay? So just bear with this for a while and understand that I may bring into the part two just how much Jude and Peter, the two dudes, knew the book of Enoch, but we're just it's just not worth going through that. We, we know that in two places, the exact same context, they're in chains of darkness waiting for the great day. And that's the focus on this. But there's another type of boundary. And you got to know this one to, uh, to know the players. So, and you know it pretty well. I, this is like the 80 millionth time I've, I've done this section of scripture in the beginning uh, we'll just start with verse 8, where God is talking to Job. And he goes, well, who enclosed the sea with doors? When it, bursting forth, it, the sea, went out from the womb. When I made clouds, it, the sea's garment, and thick darkness, the sea's swaddling man. And I placed boundaries on it, the sea, and set a bolt in a door, or doors. And I said, or gates, actually, you could translate that. Verse 11. And I have said, God said to the sea, Mr. Sea, that's, that's far enough. No further. Your proud waves are stopping right here, buddy. And this is God speaking to the sea, right? 
because the sea has ears, right? No, <laughs> it's personification, but he's speaking to the beings that are in the sea causing the commotion. And this is a figure of speech, metonymy, used of the sea and the beings in the sea over and over and over again. You've heard me teach the celestial sea, so it's coming out your ears, but that one is important here. Here's the other place where you can see the boundary. God, let there be a firmament where? In the midst of the waters. What waters? The waters in Genesis 1-2 that the Spirit of God is moving over that were all higgly-piggly. They were welter and they caused the earth to be welter and waste. God made a firmament, divided the waters which are under the firmament from the waters which are above the firmament. So there's waters above this firmament. Firmament is a boundary. It's also a construct because we've been up there. It ain't firm and it's not a dome. But the, you, the, the Hebrew prophets thought it was a dome. Why? Because they didn't have hot air balloons. They didn't have rocket ships. They looked up. The clouds were there. The clouds obscured the stars at times. It says in, I think it's Job, that the clouds obscure the throne of the Almighty because he's above the firmament. His, the beams of his chamber are in the waters. You know, more in Job here. The departed spirits tremble under the waters. Their inhabitants naked is Sheol before him, God. And Abaddon, that's the word destruction, has no covering. It's just a place. He stretches out the north over the empty space. He hangs the earth on nothing. He wraps up the waters in his clouds. The, the clouds does not burst under them. I understand that's weird English there. Why, don't, why, don't, why not the clouds do not? I don't know. The clouds does not burst on every translation. He obscures the face of the full moon. That's the word throne in the Hebrew in some of the better texts. He obscures the face of his throne and spreads his clouds over it. He has inscribed a circle on the surface of the waters, the boundary of light and darkness. We'll get into this. The pillars of heaven tremble are amazed at his God's rebuke. Why? Because he quieted the sea with his power. His understanding shattered Rahab. Who the hell is Rahab, Bob? The dragon. By his breath, Ruach, it's the word spirit, the heavens were cleared. Can you say verse 3? Let there be light clouds. Light, get rid of the clouds. There's light. His hand pierced the flying serpent. So here's the circle that God's seeing. I drew God. There's God. I drew him. There's the circle. Okay, of the earth. What are you saying? The earth's flat. Yes, to the prophet, the earth is flat. But it appears to God as a circle. And here we go. Here's another verse. The circle of the oldest map on the planet was showing you how they thought. There's the waters, okay? All around, it's a circle. This is a Babylonian map. I've shown this time and time again. There's others, but it, this one makes it so obvious that there's water all around because that's as far as they've gone and the islands that's another teaching sometime um anyway here's here's the firmament right it's the dome over the flat earth okay uh, is it flat to really no the earth is a globe let's get real folks let's not get funky let's not even get spooky it's just crazy and here is both together so you can see it really clearly the circle of the earth, it's sort of a perspective here, and the firmament over, okay? This is the correct conceptualization of cosmic geography for the ancient Hebrew and Christian prophet. They all thought this way. None of them contradicted this. We're going to get into Sheol really big because I say here at the bottom, there are beings under the earth. They're right here. They're right there in Sheol, and we're going to see it. Philippians, for this reason also God highly exalted him, Jesus, bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee, every, every knee will bow. Where? Those who are in heaven. Ooh. Those on earth. Ooh. Those under the earth. What? Yeah. There's people that are going to have to bow the knee that are under the earth. Where are they? <laughs> They're right now in prison. And that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord of the glory of God the Father. Um, I don't know if I say it later here, but next 
two weeks from now, which is when I'll do part two, uh, you'll see, and some of you already know very well, that Jesus went to Tartarus to preach to those people that were in prison and show them that he was raised from the dead, just like those Hebrew prophets said. Well, here's another one, okay? Revelation, if you don't believe, 12, uh, 5, 12, and 13, saying in a loud voice, worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Let's say them all together. And every treated, every created thing which is in heaven, on the earth, under the earth, or in the sea. Oh, they added that one. All of these dudes uh, and all things in them, meaning the creatures, I heard saying to him, uh, heard saying, these people, these entities, you know, every created thing said, quote, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. And if you read Isaiah 13 and 14, folks, do me the favor. Before next two weeks comes, just take 13 and 14 together. Isaiah, read it slowly, read it a million times, and you'll see that there are alive beings in Sheol because they talk to Lucifer when he gets thrown there. But you'll see that if you read so a couple of more, just so you know that it's not just the Christian scriptures that say it, but it says in Isaiah 44, 23, sing ye, O heavens, because they can, right? No, the people in heaven, for the Lord hath done it. Shout ye lower parts of the earth, because the earth can belch out with the best. No, the people that are in the lower parts of the earth break forth into singing mountains, forest trees. The Lord hath redeemed Jacob, glorified himself in Israel. That's eschatological, folks. You saw that, the, you know, the, the two I gave to you here are eschatological. When's this going to happen? When, when the judgment day, folks, <laughs> there's a day coming when everybody will bow the knee. I think Michael will tell us he's got a certain way of saying it. We'll say, hold that till later, Michael. Uh, but it's the end of the end when the judgment, why are they held in chains until the judgment day? Because well, we'll get into that. Okay, so they're in the lower parts of the earth, and they're still there. So here's one more. Maybe the last. Is it the last? Close to, oh, three more. This one I thought would bless you. Uh, Jesus walking around Galilee. They sailed to the country of Gadarenes or the Gergesenes, whichever one this is. There's textual variants here, uh, which is opposite Galilee. So it's on the eastern shore. So um and when he came out onto the land, this is Jesus, that dude, he was met by a man from the city who was possessed with demons. Uh, I believe that possessed with demons is one Greek word. Somebody can correct me, but it's just demonized. It doesn't mean possessed like in, like, what was, what was that great movie? But it's just demonized. He was demonized. They were in, they were out, they were around, they were bothering him. In this case, they were in him. And who had not put away any clothing from put on any clothing for a while. So he was naked and was not living in a house, but in the tombs. Gotta love it. Seeing Jesus, he cried out and fell before him as they all do. What are you doing here, Jesus, son of the most high God? I beg you, don't bother me. Don't torment me. For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. I ain't coming. I ain't coming. And you can't make me. So he's having a discussion. Okay, for it had seized him many times, right? This this unclean spirit, and um, was bound with chains and shackles and kept under guard. And yet he would break his bonds and be driven by the demon devil, I fourteen, into the desert. And Jesus asked him, "What's your name?" And he said, "Legion." For many devils had entered him. They were imploring him not to command them to go into the abyss. Now, uh, there was a herd of many swine feeding in the mountain, blah, blah, blah. He throws them into the, uh, or in, into the swine, or they go into the swine, whatever way you want to take it. Uh, first notice, these devils knew Jesus, had the ability to do what they thought he could, or maybe not, uh, because they might have been lower on the totem pole as privates, uh, to send them into the abyss. So what's up with the abyss? Well, the abyss is the pit. The pit is Sheol. If we're really talking about it, 
these were some of the one third of the angels that sided with the dragon once they got down here and they were doing demonic things, which they do because they're devils and they're demonic. So they're disobeying the natural order. And so they knew Jesus could throw them there or they were uh, scared that Jesus could throw them there. And why would he be throwing them there? Because they were sinning. And he doesn't, right? Or, or, they, get away, or they get away real quick. There's a lot of different ways you can go with this story. But there is a thing right there that they know of an abyss that can be sending them, you know, away from what they really want to do. Um, so anyway, conclusions from tonight. The dragon committed the original sin, inundating the cosmos with a C. The secret was instituted. Only know that from the Christian scriptures, the three that we read, you know, before the foundations. Angels sin originally in Genesis 6 called the sons of God, but some stay in heaven. They keep their first, um, you know, what's it in, in, in King James, their first estate, I guess it is. There's a prison for recalcitrant angels, sons of God, and it's in Tartarus. It's the same in the Greek cosmic geography. They stole it from where? From the Semitic, not even just the Hebrews. It was common to all Semitic cultures that there was a place underground where spirits were imprisoned. Not just the Hebrew Bible. Anyway, verse 5, Hebrew Bible gets it straight. You know, why are they there? Well, they're they're in punishment mode. They're in they're in reclamation mode. And I'm gonna tell you, some of them do are reclaimed at the end. Their sin wasn't that bad that God can't forgive their sin. Can he? Of course he can. Anyway, those who don't stay where they're supposed to stay are punished. There are rules. And you get to the point where at the end there's a war that breaks out. It's called a rebellion in other places. The dragon is the instigator, and he's thrown to earth and eventually to hell. How do we know that? Because we can read that, that the angel of the abyss in Revelation chapter, what is it, 20, grabs a chain, love that verse, grabs a chain, pulls open the top of the abyss, throws the damn guy in there for a thousand years. Guess where you find him? Isaiah 14, verse 9. Sheol awakes up and says, what the hell are you doing here? Read it. This, read it. Please read this stuff. It's just like a movie. Verse number eight, there's another boundary, the beginning, the firmament and the circle of the earth where the light and darkness come together. Angels can leave heaven when allowed. They can ascend and descend. And then some of them know the rules and uh, break them. And some of them know and are afraid of what's coming. So, I'll show you more in the next session. Jesus visits Sheol. Yes, he does. And there are some unpearly gates that we need to understand. Um, should I give you a, a peek? Yeah, why not? Jesus in hell. That should be the name of the next session. Jesus goes to hell. In, not in a handbasket. I told that to, to uh, I think it was Ron, right? Uh, gates of hell, we'll talk about that. Psalm 89, 12. This will be in the PDF if you want to study ahead. I don't mind. Psalm 149, oh my God, it's great. <laughs> it's a great thing. We'll get back into the map. Water all around has a limits. Why the abyss has a cover so they don't get out, but they do get out later because that's in Psalm, chapter, Psalm 2 down at the bottom there. Psalm 93, 96, the flood and the waters roar. Uh, what waters? No, it's not the waters that roar. It's the people in the waters. And there's not bad, only bad angels there. There are angels uh, that aren't in the mountain of God is what I should have said there. Then there's the angel of the abyss, whom I just mentioned, that lets, lets locusts out. Those are good guys. Those of you that thought locusts were all bad, a locust in the book of Revelation, not so bad. Then there's Joel 2 and 3, Revelation locusts, blah, blah, blah. End of the earth locust armies. Uh, Gen my favorite thing, Jesus the Destroyer, uh, because he's given a task, folks, and he does some chopping with his fierce and powerful sword. Uh, Psalm 2, cast off their fetters. Read Psalm 2, too, also, because uh, the rebellion and then the war is there. Isaiah 14 and then locusts. Well, I said it twice. So 
that's the end of session one.